following interview was conducted with Ronald Dampier for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on November 18, 2015 at WCCR Studio in Cary Quad. The interviewer is Renee Gorder. Well, thank you for offering to do this interview with us. Um, can you tell me when you first came to Purdue and what brought you here? Well, my father graduated from Purdue in 1929, <laughs> and it was assumed when I was born that I would go to Purdue, as my two sons did, a family tradition. <laughs> Now, it was not assumed that I would get involved in radio. I was taking agriculture. And when I got home and I told my mother that I was involved in the radio station, her first reaction was, now you stay away from that, you don't know anything about it. <laughs> Mom, I've been helping run that thing for six months now. Oh. But you know, I run a business today, I'm totally unrelated uh, to the radio station, but I learned how a business hold itself together and how it is basically managed. I may run a dairy equipment business, but it really fundamentally is no different than running a radio station. You have to plan and coordinate, set your goals, develop your staff, I learned how to run a business here, not in class. I can't think of one thing I learned in class that has really helped me succeed in my current business. But I would never have made it if it wasn't for the lessons that I learned here at Curry Club Radio. So what was, what was your major specifically? I majored in dairy manufacturing, which it, in its infinite wisdom the university has seen to drop this program. But they still have a few things around. Even when I came in today, I went down to the pilot lab and lo and behold, I picked up a couple ideas that I'm going to take back to my business. You may not make ice cream like the good old days at Smith Hall and all the other good things that they did there. Uh, the um, Swiss cheese that Dr. Parmalee and Fred Babel, uh, Dr. Babel uh, developed, uh, really kind of put uh, Purdue Dairy on the map. And that's what I was involved in. This was a student activity. And as far as career opportunities, it was never taken seriously that way. It is like any other student activity. You did it because it was fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I worked 40 hours a week in here, just like a regular job, though. Don't get me wrong. I took it seriously. And I think anything you do in life, if you take it seriously, it's going to take you somewhere. So what, what was it like living in the residence halls? Can you tell us some of your experiences as a student? It was chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> in the old days, I was here at the tail end of the GI uh, influx. We were packed in like sardines. There were 30 of them in our room when I started. It was an end room in the Hall East, and it couldn't have taken any more. Um, it was my first extended time away from home. Fortunately, I had been properly prepared my parents had sent me away to summer camp, both the church and Y camp, and so I had slept away from home. When I came here as a student, I found the number one cause of kids dropping out of school the first semester, they had never even as much as gone to grandma's. And they just blew a gasket. They came apart at the seams. I take life pretty well in stride. I had proper, I had good parents. I believed in myself. I didn't make particularly good grades, but I believed in myself, and I still do. And I think those are key ingredients to success. But the training I got here, it was more practical down to earth. When you're in class, they teach you a bunch of theory. 
when you're in here, you're trying to hold an operation together. We operated semi-commercially. Back in the old days, there was a uh, business down in the village called Southwest Student Department Store, like that granted us a certain amount of um, credit each month if we would give them so many plugs. And so, in effect, we operated like a commercial station. Not many. There, we didn't do many commercials, but we did enough that we got the feel. We ran to professional standards. Um, half of our engineers had FCC Class B licenses. Uh, I don't remember his first name, but a fellow by the name of Bloom was probably the most important man on the staff. No, he wasn't the president. He was in charge of training. If you weren't on management staff, as I was, you didn't get in front of an open mic unless you had been properly trained. And you were expected to follow FCC rules in every respect. Now, being a student, operated, we couldn't be here extended hours. We had to go to class occasionally. And I remember one time when I was in charge, I was up in my room and a fellow came on the mic. There was a slur in his voice. I was down that uh, many steps at a time and flew across the quad and marched up here and pointed out, you're fired. And I slipped him behind the mic and I continued the program. Why? He'd been drinking. You could. Uh, you could tell the slur in his voice, and we followed FCC rules. You don't drink and drive or uh, get in front of a mic. It just is not permitted. The music was a little different than that day. Back in 19... 51, when we started, there was no rock and roll, but there was a lot of jazz, Dixieland, basically. We also got LPs in from uh, BBC and the French Broadcasting System, so we had standard programs. We did newscast. We... Uh, would survey things on campus. And one of the things I was telling the staff here, one time we did a survey of smoking habits. I think that's apropos because the culture is very different. Back in those days, a high percentage smoked. Coming in as freshmen, only a few girls, like 10% smoked, maybe 40% of the fellows. By the time they graduated, 92% of the girls were smoking. Only 56% of the boys. Why the difference? Because when exam time came, the girls took up smoking to control themselves. They used it uh, as a crutch to get through their term papers and their midterms. And it's, it's surveys like this that we did on many subjects that uh, made up our newscast. We didn't have... Um, pipelines to the standard public cast. Uh, we had to find it on, on campus. Uh, we did a mock political convention on remote. We had a Gates controller in those days that instead of the professional equipment that you have here, it was homemade, except for that Gates controller and the two turntables we had. Everything else, we did it ourselves. And the greatest joy in the world from the engineer's standpoint was when something broke, we got to fix it. <laughs> well, being an ag student, I just liked things to work. And for fortunately, it never broke <laughs> down while I was on. But that's the way it was. 24 hours a day, it took 120 of us to run the thing. You say, 120? That's a lot more than it does now. But remember, we were doing this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that we had a live signal going out. Oh, yes, in the middle of nights, particularly on weekends, we didn't sit here in front of the mic. We would pick up a Chicago uh, a station, all music, all night, and play it when we didn't. But the vast majority of time, it was a student in front of this mic. And in those days, we had the engineer on one side of the wall 
and uh, the announcer on the other side, except maybe after hours. Uh, the program I did was uh, late in the evening, and I spun my own records and did my own commentary. But we were properly trained, and I learned to use my voice for maximum impact, as the others did, because of Bloom. He trained us. He trained us well. And when it was over, I would go back actually on the hall and ask the, the others, how did I do? What did you like? What didn't you? I was trying to perform, and I think every other disc jockey in the program was trying to do the same thing. We learned what worked and what didn't. We learned how to present. And these are invaluable lessons that I have used. I do sales work now as well as engineering. And the lessons I learned here in how to use your voice have made the world a difference in my business. I'm a better salesman because of WCCR. Can't say it helped my engineering any, but it made me a better salesman and it made me better at handling people. Because we had a lot more people to handle. We say, well, how could it take all that? To well, remember, this is a student thing. And we had girls in from uh, WRH, Women's Residence Halls. So, you know, one of the greatest side activities was courting. <laughs> we did a lot of that up here in the old days. So it was fun as well as work. Yes, we worked to professional standards, but we had fun. We did play the play of the uh, football games. Now, admittedly, this university didn't trust us entirely. They would send somebody over from WBAA to uh, sit at our elbows to make sure that we didn't blow it, but we would feed the signal out to the opposing team and on occasion to a few other stations. So we got control experience, professional control experience in broadcasting. B before a game, it would be a beehive activity as we were setting up and running our tests to make sure everything was going to work correctly when we went live. For other activities, in the old days, one of the things was a mock political convention. Back in those days, we didn't do things like we do now. The parties sent delegates to a big convention and you fought for your candidate. Well, we went through all of that. It must have taken three days. We had to pull the mock, uh, we had to pull the uh, gates uh, remote and we took it over uh, to the, the gym where everything was set up uh, for the broadcasting. And we did our remotes with interviews just like on the professional stations. Uh, we, we tried to run, do the same things and do them at professional standards. Uh, so I, I think that was a, a, a really good th thing. Um, we got written up in a national electronics magazine one time, in part by the way we ran the station, but in part of it had to do with the fact that we had, while carrier current, it was a first class carrier turn. And I'll, uh, Bert Jaffe, uh, under, uh, I can't remember Todd's first name, uh, that was head of campus electronics, uh, built that equipment down there and we took great pride in it. It was our equipment, except for the gates controller, of course, and uh, the tables, but we built it and we took care of it. We serviced it. Um, now you say, well, did you ever do anything really wild? <laughs> yes. Back in the old days, the halls had telephones, not in the rooms, but in booths along the hall. One day following a football game, the guys decided to have a panty raid. You say, well, how did you ever pull that off? Well, the girls were all, you couldn't ask for more cooperation. They did all the switching and the play-by-play -play inside the dorms. The guys went down to stealing their panties. Great listening. We never had ratings like that, and we went on for about a half an hour before the administration told us to cool it, and so we had to <laughs> shut down. So we had fun. Yes, we ran professionally, but we had fun. Now, what about starting it? You were instrumental in starting the station, correct? Can you tell us about how WCC okay. first got its start? In, 
in the spring of 51, a, a group of double E's, and I was not involved at that time, commissioned Bert Jaffe, who was going to be here over the summer and work down in campus electronics, to build a phono oscillator. And the original concept, we were going to play a stack of records so we had good study music. Something went amiss. When we came back that fall, we had a not only the equipment uh, with the transmitter and everything, we had a booth for the engineer, we had a booth for the announcers, shells to uh, stack the records on. Uh, we had a radio station. <laughs> and thanks to Chuck Terrell, who was president, and his right-hand man, Dick Matheson, and, oh, I wish I could remember his name, but Bloom was really a critical man there in developing professional standards of all the staff. Phil Kaiser put in a telephone uh, system that ran out for the technical people. And Bert Jaffe, uh, of course, uh, that built the original quit equipment under Todd's supervision, uh, continued uh, to be chief engineer. And, and he had a, a Class B license, like uh, I think I've already said, uh, half the engineers did. So uh, we did it. We were proud of what we did. And you, you said that you had your own program. What, what was that? What did you play and what, what Well, okay, I, I was a tail ender sort of thing. <laughs> uh, I, I had a Friday night slot and I, for lack of a better name, I called it the grab bag. <laughs> In other words, I took a bunch of records that nobody else wanted to play and I tried to build commentary around it so that they heard music that they wouldn't normally hear. And I tried to get commentary using the training I had here to hold their attention, to make it a decent program. And then, of course, after it was all over, I would go back in the dorms and uh, have the guys critique me so I knew what I did right and what I did wrong because I took it seriously. And I'm glad I did, because this, this has been an invaluable experience. I just wish more of my friends that started this were still around. But unfortunately, I'm 83, and the original staff, were they still alive, would have been anywhere from my age to a, a year or two older. And some of them had some bad habits. And they aren't here. And so I hope I'm getting this right, because I'm one of the few that can tell you how it was in the beginning. It was fun. It was hard work, but it was fun. So you, um, you came to Purdue, you lived in Cary, then you were drafted and went... At the end of Florida. my junior year, well, see, I, I, I had to take a draft deferment test uh, at the end of my second year. And I passed that, so that allowed me to stay in Purdue another year. But at the end of my junior year, the Korean War was still going on, I was drafted. And so there was a break. And when I came back, I lived in Hall X. And we built a little station much like this called WRX at that time. Now that's Meredith today, but in those days we called it Hall X. I was one of the few guys to ever have formal closets. <laughs> but that's the way it was. Uh, we didn't seem to take it as seriously over at uh, uh, WRX as they did at WCCR, but this was the control. Other dorms set up uh, current stations over time, but to the best of my knowledge, none of them consistently operated at professional standards. And I was back one time for a visit in that particular year, even WCCR wasn't at professional standards. I felt sad. It's like somebody had left a legacy down. Now, I haven't heard the current staff, but the setup here tells me that it's set up professionally. I would presume that the people run it professionally, maybe a little more efficiently than we did, but I bet you there's not near the amount of courting takes place. <laughs> so what about um, Purdue after you came back? How had it, how, how had it changed when you returned from, from the war? 
Well, I have came back two or three times over the years, and it's only uh, this year that uh, I made a, a visit prior to this that you were in the new setup here. Before, it was always upstairs in the tower, and we had more room up there, and we had to watch our head or we, we, we'd get bumped a little bit. But um, the equipment changed. You've gradually evolved to commercial equipment. I was glad to see that. And gradually, I knew over time the um, body count gradually got down. Maybe it's a little bit like business, too. Maybe you, they became just more efficient in the management of it. But by having 120 as a student, that gave me management experience of people that was helpful when I owned my own factory. It was the, the 40 for 30 people I had in the plant were probably easier to manage because of the experience I had here managing 120. Now you'd say, but they weren't paid employees, they were volunteers. Yes, but they took it seriously. Of course, you could get fired from here. I fired one once for not living up to professional standards. Uh, these things happened. <laughs> what about Purdue in general? How had, how had it changed as, as well, the Well, okay. Classes changed? I came here at the tail end of the GI influx. So a large part, over half the student body, were returning GIs. They were older and more mature, and they questioned the professors like none they'd ever had before. Many of them had spent their career in the service, not out um, fighting the enemy, but going to service schools. And some of them came back here were really sharp. I know one of them has spent three years in electronics at Navy Pier, and boy, the professors had a lot of respect for him. Now, back in an era when uh, starting salaries for engineers would run something like 4,800 a year, we had one fellow that had directed the installation of uh, aircraft landing uh, strips on, I believe it was Guadalcanal, under gunfire. He got a job for 9000 when he graduated. That was just blow your mind. Now, if you factor that in for inflation, that's starting out of Purdue right now at 100000 a year. That's not too shabby. Now, they were more mature. They set the bar high for people like me that came the traditional way out of high school into college. I didn't do as well as those people. I wasn't as mature. But then nobody did as well as those guys. They, they set a new standard for Purdue. But what happened in that eight years following World War II with the GIs back here, they produced more engineers nationally out of college than the entire history of the United States up to that time. And that's one reason this country has developed, because we've continued to uh, produce highly trained people in all kinds of specialties. But Purdue particularly and its engineering has made a reputation. There are other schools that may be noted in Indiana, but when you get out of Indiana and you talk about a school, yeah, Notre Dame gets mentioned now and then. And there's a little school over Terre Haute called Paul Telly, uh, Rose Polly that in its specialty areas is noted, but Purdue is the big man on campus nationwide, then and now. My youngest son designs helicopter components for a firm in uh, Connecticut. He went up to management real fast. Yes, he had good language skills, but he had good technical training too. He went through in the co-op program, so like the GIs, he was a little more mature when he graduated than your typical student. And when you take his maturity and his training He's led a remarkable life, and I know many other Purdue students have too. I, 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 many of them, like my friend Bert Jaffe, the original um, chief engineer here, went on to own his own company in, in South Bend, where he designed some really neat pieces of equipment that he sold to larger companies. And in part, that experience came from WCCR. Not entirely, because he learned something in class. <laughs> <laughs>
what about you personally? Did did coming back? Did you, did you see that affecting your your classes or the way that you approached your studies, or even the the station itself? Well, you know, when I come back, I have a decent memory. At least I think I do. And it it brings things back of how life was when I was much less mature <laughs> and thought I was applying myself, but I know now, after having operated my own business for many, many years, I wasn't all that mature. <laughs> I'm proud of Purdue, okay? I'm proud of what it did for me. I wouldn't have sent my two kids here if I wasn't. I would have sent them elsewhere. Because there are a couple other schools around the country that are not too shabby. Um, what about student traditions or customs? Are there any that you remember or that have made an impression on you? Well, you know, I don't know whether they still do it anymore or not. But the seniors used to wear their senior cords not only in the fall, but some of them all year long. I haven't seen a senior cord lately. Do they do that anymore? I, I don't know. I don't. A few. A few. I've seen a few, a few of them here and there. They were ubiquitous time. when I was a student here. Now, of course, I was a dairy student, and mine proclaimed my option <laughs> on the side <laughs> of my cords. And unfortunately, over the years, I, I'm not fat today. But I do weigh more than when I weigh 155 now. When I married, I was 128. I couldn't get in my senior cords today, okay? <laughs> I was thin. But that image-wise, that is, of course, on campus, other things that change. It was not that uncommon to see people smoking in the old days. It's a pretty rare thing this day and age. Um, and in the fall, these little beanies, do they still do that? They've gone by the wayside. Yeah. Well, as a freshman, um, I had my beanie. But I'm of Scotch heritage. I didn't like to pay for them. I had a, a little grocery sack, and we, we could open the w windows in, the, in Cary East where I lived at night, and I could bag myself a bat. And I could take that bat down uh, to not Stanley Kohler. There was another science building next to it, isn't there? I can't remember the name now. And I could sell it for enough to buy a new beanie if my old one got stolen. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was supposed to remember classroom things and all that, but it, those are not the things you remember, you know? <laughs> I remember catching bats. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the first I've heard of that. You, you know, and it's funny too. Back in those days, started out, I think it was about six to one, boys to girls, and the girls just cried for dates. We boys assumed that with the ratio being what it was, there's no point in asking one. They all had so many dates they didn't know what to do with. Consequently, the girls really didn't get all that many dates. But as the GI influx cleared out, the ratio tightened up a little bit, and you know what? The girls got more dates with less boys on campus. <laughs> now, that's been a real cultural shift on this campus. But it used to that a girl's biggest competition was the girl back home. Uh, <coughs> now I dated on camps. I didn't date in high school, <coughs> but I dated here. And you know, some of the girls weren't really pretty. Uh, Purdue's not noted for pretty girls, or it wasn't in no those days. But some of them were quite respectable. But every girl I ever dated was just as nice as any girl you'd ever hope to meet anywhere. Now, I was a little selective as to where I went to pick them up. In those days, I don't know how it is now, the religious foundations played a very important role on campus. At the dorms didn't serve meals Sunday evening, but the foundations had cost meals, 
And I always went to there, and that's where we co-mingled, and that's where I got most of my dates. I, I dated, well, one girl I would have married if I hadn't gotten drafted, and she ended up marrying somebody else. She wasn't pretty, but you couldn't ask for a nicer person than what she was. And that's what I thought uh, of the Purdue girls. It was really a high caliber. Yes, they had some beauties among them, but for the most part, they were just good people. And, and I have very fond memories of my dating at Purdue. Now, did you meet your wife at Purdue? No. Um, after I came back uh, from the service, I didn't really date any serious in my senior year. I went to Indianapolis and I attended Butler while I did other work. And again, like the Foundation House, there was a certain church that was noted for young unmarried adults. And I went down there and I make people decisions very quickly. When it comes to hiring my business, sometimes I only had seconds to put my thumb up or thumb down on an employer. Well, the same thing was a wife. The girl that I met there, um, like me, she came from a poor background because back during the Depression, there wasn't much of any other kind of people around. <laughs> uh, uh, she was a nurse, which appealed to me particularly, and she just really had a nice disposition. I took her out, my first date was to hear the Salty Dogs. Now, I don't know what, how many of you people know the Salty Dogs, but that was a Purdue Dixieland jazz band, a real high eh, caliber. And I came back uh, years later when they were playing here at Purdue, and they were still going and played regularly at uh, nightclubs in Chicago. And as far as I know, they're still going, e even after all these years. But anyway, we had such a good time with that, we could have married that night. And it wasn't long before we did. <laughs> and we were married for 58 great years. No, she wasn't a Purdue co-ed. And I suppose by Hollywood standards, she wasn't a raving beauty, although she was nice looking. Now, don't get me wrong. She, she was a very attractive uh, woman. But the confidence I gained in dating here at Purdue helped me catch that girl, okay? <laughs> so it's just like the radio training. You get your training where and when you can and you use it however you can. <laughs> now you're telling me that you've done a lot of different things career-wise. Can you, can you run me through what you've done from graduating up until now? Well, I don't know that my experience is more varied than most. I started out in my very short, short uh, uh, term job uh, I, I did some um, work as a biologist, my, uh, and that didn't work out. After my wife and I married, I came back. Then I went into polio manufacturing. Shortly, I was switched over, became assistant parasitologist uh, for a pharmaceutical company. Never had a course in parasitology, but I did all right. <laughs> I wrote scholarly articles. One of them even had a, uh, the um, publisher put a gratuitous PhD after me. So I guess the article was all right. <laughs> uh, after that, but I, I did, kept getting sick off the experimental animals, so I went into accounting. I'd had one course at Purdue on accounting, and then I, I'd taken some more accounting to Butler uh, after I was out. Um, then uh, I kind of worked myself uh, up doing different accounting jobs. Uh, I left when it, it didn't seem like uh, my employer was the place to stay. And I went on to another place, got a good experience. Um, the, com the division I was in uh, was struggling. They sent somebody down from corporate and I was assigned to uh, show the man from corporate why the thing wasn't performing. I laid it on the line and I knew it was going to cost me my job and it did because I caused the division manager to lose his job, and so no other incoming manager would trust me. So I went on as controller of another company, and then later on I went into um, being cost accounting uh, for a large company that had some problems, and lo and behold, I got fired again. That's all part of life. And in my final talk with uh, my boss, I said, you may not believe in me, but I believe in myself. 
you know, I went to another company and got hired and I replaced some, uh, a man that had done what I refused to do at the place I got fired and it practically wrecked the company. So if you get fired, just pick yourself up off the ground. If you believe in yourself, you'll find another opening. I ended up buying one of their divisions after the company got sold and the new owners didn't want it. And so I found myself back in the dairy business again, owning Chorboy Milking Machine Company. Um, I turned this uh, losing business into a profitable one on a dime. It was doing fine till the government came along with something called dairy herd buyout. That cost me 90% of my customers, plus the government in their infinite wisdom said all the manufacturers had to buy back everything in dealers' hands except rubber goods um, because it was going to break all the dealers. And so I was the political fall guy, along with a few other <laughs> manufacturers, uh, for paying for that dairy herd bu uh, buyout. And they put 90% of my business, uh, customers out of business. So ultimately I sold that division to another. I was retired for a day, bored stiff. I don't like retirement, you know, never have. A friend of mine suggested, why don't you make butter churns? Great idea. <laughs> Today, if you look on the web page, you'll find five pages of my products. I have morphed into an engineer. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I do sales work. I couldn't succeed as a salesman if it hadn't been for the talking ability that I was given here at WCCR. And that's another time when what I learned here, not in classroom, was among the most valuable experiences I had at Purdue. And I'm very serious about that. WCCR is largely responsible for what success I've enjoyed in life. You know, part of it had something to do that I worked my tail off. I still, at 83, I still work 60 hours a week, and I enjoy every minute of it. Should have taken engineering. <laughs> well, you sort of did in a roundabout way. <laughs> well, you know, I learned people skills here and elsewhere that have been invaluable. I learned service. You think in business that when you advertise, that's going to get you business. It hasn't really gotten me that much business. You know what's gotten business? There are trade events and people go to sessions where they learn how to make cheese and they have dinner meetings and they all get to talking. And they say, where'd you get your equipment? Oh, I bought it from Ron Napier, uh, at, as I'm knowing now, uh, CleanFlow. The last five referrals I got came that way, not from advertising, but person to person. Why? because I learned the importance of personal service. And that was the way I was involved in this station. It wasn't just barking at people. When, when you ha you're responsible for people, you ensure their success by getting behind them and helping them in every way you can. And then you carry this over into your business. You help your customer in every way, knowing that in most cases, you're, there's no payback there that as far as you know, except they go to a meeting and they tell somebody else, hey, you get from this guy. He'll help you in a lot more ways than the equipment. Just yesterday, I sent some emails off to one of the last customers showing them how they could uh, do certain things to help their business. And again, it was an attitude that I developed here. So uh, what do you think makes the resident, residence halls at Purdue unique? What makes them great? Well, in the old days, we used to complain about the food, and I just got <laughs> taken down to move. Uh, that can't be the complaint now, but it really wasn't all that bad, you know. It wasn't mom's cooking, but it was, really, we had good food in those days. 
for the most part, there wasn't a whole lot of partying in the halls. Uh, you could study. And I know some of the living units, known as fraternities, do a bit more partying than what the class of people that um, stayed in halls. And I think the fact that we were in a more serious environment, that made Cary Hall a good experience for me. I still have limited communication with one of my roommates, the only one that I'm sure is still alive. Some of the people, most of the people I knew, had some things in their, their private life that weren't the best lifestyle choices. They aren't with us anymore. I have always tried not only to do right to others, I do right to my own body. And I think that's very important. If you'll notice today at the meal, I didn't load up on sweets or a lot of other things. It was a great salad I had, and I had what I wanted, and you know, there's nothing more to keep me going than a good salad. Oh yeah, I'll be hungry for supper and I'll want something then. Slapper me another salad. <laughs> oh, I eat other things. There's very few things that I don't eat. Things have changed, even in food. Like when I was here, there was a product called Chinese gooseberries. People didn't like Chinese gooseberries, but today, being re-Christianed, re -Christianed, Kiwi, we think it's great. <laughs> so what you call something is important. I know, I know you've been talking about this the whole time, but how, how has Purdue influenced your life? Well, yeah. You would probably like for me to say that the preparation I got in my profession, or in my major, made me a success in life. And you know, it wasn't until just a few years ago that a friend of mine wanted to start a cheese plant, and I hadn't made cheese in 50 years, that I went in to help him. That was the first time I used what I was taught in class, because the industry was in form of consolidation. There were very few opportunities and I didn't have the money to put in my own processing plant. And that's why having my own business today making equipment, I cater to people that are pulling themselves up by their uh, bootstraps. I remember what I wasn't able to use my major at Purdue. I really wasn't. There is a certain dairy that I won't name at this time, I don't think it would be appropriate, that caused <coughs> Purdue to shut its creamery down because amongst the statements they had that the kids didn't get any practical experience on the floor so they shouldn't have it and besides they were selling in stores and taking business away from tax paying companies. Well, we couldn't let the kids work in the plant because this and a certain other people in the business put so much pressure on the school that Dusty never felt safe in putting us out there to the, that this university was going to get really uh, bad things would happen. So except for helping my friend start his cheese making operation, I haven't directly used the experience. However, I'm designing the equipment now, and if I hadn't ha gone through the school here, I wouldn't know what to design. <laughs> sure, at home we had a small processing plant, and I knew how to pasteurize milk that I uh, that I did every weekend, but uh, I didn't use my major. And that's the, I think, what that says is, if you get a good education as opposed to a training, you can adapt, you can do a whole bunch of things. You have to believe in yourself, work hard, have integrity in everything you do, and you'll make a go of it. I don't care what you major in. My youngest son went through civil engineering. He's designing helicopters, so he's no different, <laughs> you know? <laughs> He's very successful. 
the oldest son, he um, was trained in meat processing. Well, he's head of uh, the meat department of a medium-sized uh, grocery chain. So he's using his major. I can't understand how that ever happened. But, <laughs> <laughs> but get yourself a good education. You'll find a way to use it. Definitely. I think that's about, those are all the questions that I came up with to ask you, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, I think I've mentioned some of this. Take yourself seriously and don't spend a lot of time partying. Yes, you need to unwind and do some things other than work or you're going to be a rather dull person. Keep learning your whole life. I've taken, I wasn't going to let my father outdo me. I, I took my last Purdue University course when I was 70 at Extension uh, in, um, in Richmond. But I also buy uh, courses from the great courses. And I find myself um, studying things that weren't even known when I was a student. Um, it keeps, and I have been able to broaden myself as well as deepen it. So be a lifetime learner. I think that's the message there. You'll do it through th things that you can read. I know when, uh, before I had actually asked my wife out the first time, there were, uh, three others from that young uh, adult group that had gone in the car, and I had a couple books I was reading. They were on the back shelf. My wife picked it up to see what I read. One of them was Lincoln Barnett's One, Two, Three, Infinity, which is a layman's explanation of Einstein's theory of relativity. And the other one was R. H. Tawney's Religion and, Reli and the Rise of Capitalism, which explains why the Jews came to be in charge of uh, the money system and the movement of goods from one part to another during the formative years of Christianity in Europe and why the Christian value system became the value system of uh, of capitalism. Now they don't teach you that in school, even at Purdue. It almost caused my wife not to go out with me, I think, though. She said to somebody else, she says, I don't think he'd be interested in me. That isn't what most people read. But believe me, if you want to grow, you've got to read things that cause you to grow. And it's that type of thing that I have read all my life. If I can understand a book in less than three readings, I figure I didn't read at the proper level. I challenge myself, and that's how I grow. And that's why I'm able, at 83, to still run my own business. Yes, I know, I've got to, I started to get into senior moments here some time back. Great thing we have today called the internet. I got on and did my research, and I found if I up my vitamin B12 and my folic acid, get at least six and maybe nine hours of aerobic exercise a week, and work math problems. <laughs> now that's the one that a lot of my friends had the hardest time swallowing. You know what, within a month I'd shook my uh, senior moments and I haven't had one since. <laughs> so you gotta live right and you gotta do the right things and do them at challenge level. Oh yeah, you'll read the funny papers and, and a few other things. But if the height of your reading is the sports section, you're not gonna cut it in life. Sooner or later, life's gonna let you down and you wonder why. 
Challenge yourself daily. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's been fun. I've enjoyed it because it's brought back an awful lot of good memories. Thank you. <laughs>